Everybody that loves the Lord, say amen. amen. I'm a week early. Usually I'm here on the fourth Sunday. Some of y'all was looking at your calendar wondering well, what is Brother Willie doing up there this week. Uh, but I'll be before you the next two Sundays. And I just want to share with you in a short series of messages for the next two weeks regarding the book of Jonah. Jonah is a fascinating book, and we're going to glean as best we can be the Lord's will for amazing sermons, not because I'm going to do them, but because the Word of God is good. Uh, Jonah is a story that everybody knows about. Okay. It was probably one of the first stories you learned in Sunday school. Amen, somebody. Uh, maybe it was David and Goliath, but at some point, you received knowledge about Jonah. It's a well of a story. I'm smiling in between my mask. Uh, we're going to find out some amazing truths about this interesting man of God. A man who found himself in conflict with God. One of the great servants of God who was in major conflict with him. Okay. And it shows us that sometimes the more we immerse ourselves in the work of the Lord, it can become taxing and full of toil and anxiety and frustration, especially when God doesn't do some things that we would like him to do. Okay. Uh, Jonah now is going to have to deal with some inner turmoil, conflict, and frustration because he and God are not seeing eye to eye right now. I'm going to turn away because that doesn't really happen to us, does it? Because we don't never have a conflict with God because we and God are always on the same page. Jonah's going to help us out. Now, here's what I'd like for you to do. If you've never done this before, please do it for the next couple of weeks. We've got four sermons. And if you're not coming back tonight, be sure to get on the website and get sermon number two. And then we'll get sermon number three next Sunday and sermon number four Sunday night, Lord's willing. And when we put them all together, it's going to give you the spiritual revelation, inspiration in such a way that you probably never had it before. Okay? If you miss one, it's like they used to say with the Cleveland Plain Dealer, you miss a day, you miss a lot. Okay. You miss one of these, it's going to be a little bit of a gap. You don't want a gap now, okay? Now, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do chapter one today. Then tonight we'll do chapter three. Next Sunday, chapter four, and end with chapter two. Why? Why not chronologically? Because chapter four, Jonah and God are still having an issue. Jonah ends the book arguing with God, and I don't want to end it like that, okay? Because chapter 2 is the money, money chapter. Jonah realizes 
that salvation is in the Lord and nobody else. And so we want to end with that. Okay? So we'll get, in, get into his arguments and frustrations about the Ninevites a little bit today, next week. But we want to end with him coming to grips with some things that all of us will need to. Okay? So everybody follow me. We got the directions. Y'all going to be good students? Okay? All right? All right? You can do some virtual learning tonight if you're not coming back. Like the kids are in school, you know? We're on virtual learning now. Okay? Few of us are in the building. Everybody else is on the computer doing virtual learning. Your kids, you're teaching virtually. We get a chance to do that now scripturally if you're not going to be back. Is that all right? Okay, all right. We see, or we will see a man of God, a prophet no less, he's coming apart at the seams. Okay? He loves God but struggles with God. You wouldn't think that a man of God such as Jonah, one of the great prophets of, of the Bible, have the inner struggles that he has. Despite that, God uses him to, to save an entire city of people, a whole city, Even after the miracle of being saved by the well and the salvation of the whole city, he is, at the end of the book, angry with God. He was an emotional mess. We want to be careful that as we serve God in ministry and invest all our time and energy in that, that we don't make it our ministry and think we're calling the shots. Okay? God is still calling the shots. And if you think that you can call them, you and God are going to have some conflict because God is running this thing. Okay? Let's not make that the problem, okay? It's God's ministry. We are just servants in it. Is that all right? We're going to discover God's passion for the lost souls in the world. When you see how this story evolves, it is going to amaze you. You're going to see the passion that God has for lost people. Because sometimes we don't want some lost people to be saved. Amen. Lights and walls. Because we like to determine who should be getting saved. Making that choice and wishing some other folk would bust hell wide open. Come on now. So we need to be careful with that, and we're going to see that despite what we think about other folk, yes, God's got passion for those who are lost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this is where the conflict between him and Jonah occurs. It's easy to become comfortable in this place. Easy to be comfortable here this morning. We're all comfortable, right? Being around people of like-mindedness, doing like, doing like the same things we do, it's a totally different situation. When we encounter people who do things opposite the way we do things. And especially if it's people we don't like. Lights, I think it's just going to be me and you today. Because this is going to be tough for some folks. 
but I know how to I know how to talk to the lights in the walls. Amen. I know how to shout all by myself. We need to remember that the people we don't like are the same people God loves. It's uh, very easy for us to forget that there was a time that we were yet sinners too. Sometimes we forget that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes we forget that. And yet Christ died for us. What's good for us is not always good for somebody else. Lord, have mercy. God's passion for the lost can turn some Christians upside down uh, because we get mad at God for saving somebody we wanted to bust hell wide open. I'm going to keep my head down and keep grinding. Okay? Can sometimes turn a church like ours upside down. Okay? Especially when God doesn't do what we think he should. Okay. So some of us uh, might get a little too comfortable with things. It's important to know that, that this is God's work. Okay. We're going to also to, uh, be discovered, and, 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 and don't be surprised when you discover how passionate God's love is for his servants. Okay? That's us. Think about it. In all the prophets of Scripture, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the books are about the message of God, but in the book of Jonah, it's about his servant, Jonah. Which really means that God not only cares about his work, but he cares about his workers. You're putting so much into God's work, don't for one minute think that God doesn't care about his workers. He doesn't care about you because he does. If God didn't care for Jonah, he could have easily kicked him to the curb and got somebody else. But he doesn't. He never gives up on Jonah. And as much as Jonah ran from him, God never gave up on him. And God will never give up on you. God cares about you more than the work you are doing for him. I'm going to say that again. God cares for you more than the work you are doing for him. A whole city, Nineveh, got saved. The book of Jonah is more about God's work in Jonah than his work in Nineveh. Now, not much is said about Nineveh in the book of Jonah, but a lot is said about Jonah in the book of Jonah. I want you to find Jonah. Okay? It's in the minor section, minor prophetic section of your Bible. Near the end, past the major prophets, you get in the Joel and Amos, all right, Obadiah. Those people sound familiar to somebody? And then you'll have Jonah. Did that help somebody or not? Okay. All right. If you get to Micah, you've gone too far. Okay. Jonah, chapter 1. This book begins with Jonah running away from God 
and ends with Jonah arguing with God about this whole ordeal with the Ninevites, which raises a question. When did Jonah write this? Probably later in his life. Why? It's hard to write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when you're mad at God. He wants us to know how not to do some of the things he did. Okay? All right? Here's the irony. He was preaching the word of God while avoiding the call of God. And you'll get that on the way home. All right? So let's look at the first couple of verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amido, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I need you to hold your space in Jonah and go with me to 2 Kings. Kings will be a little easier to find in Jonah. So if you lose Jonah, we ain't going to have time to wait for you to find it. Put an offering envelope or a bookmark or something in Jonah. Don't lose that. All right? We're going to be in 2 Kings 14. Okay? We'll start with verse... Number 23, to get a little bit of insight about this man of God. We're around the time of 780 B.C., if you are into history. And this is Jeroboam II who was reigning in Israel. And he was responsible for the northern tribes of Israel. We're talking about the ten tribes north. Judah and Benjamin were the two tribes south. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, that would be his father, the son of Naboth, who he made Israel sin. He restored the territories of Israel from the entrance near the sea of Erba, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, which he had, uh, which the Lord had spoken through the word, to the word, to, to Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah. That's our boy, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath, Okay, Jonah, known throughout all of Israel, God's servant, who had prophesied that the borders of Israel would be extended. That's in verse number 25. He restored the territories of Israel. That's one good thing that Jeroboam II did. He restored the borders of Israel. In other words, the promised land that God had given the tribes was shrank, was shrank at one time, but Jeroboam II expanded them back, allowing Israel to occupy the land that God had given to them previously. Okay? This happened under the ministry of 
Jonah. He's introduced as one of the spiritual leaders of his day, God's servant, the prophet. He was known throughout all of Israel, the northern tribes. It was Jonah who did the prophecies. He was God's man servant. Now God to Jonah tells him to go to Nineveh to preach. But Jonah refused to go. Why did he not want to go? In that day, there was one superpower that controlled all of that area, and it was the Assyrians. Okay, anybody heard of the Assyrians before? Okay, it was them. If you were to read some history about them, it would make your skin crawl, but I'm going to give you just a little bit so you'll know what type of people they were. They refined the art of torture. They terrorized the then known uh, countries that surrounded them. They hunted, killed, and tortured anything that was against them. They were ruthless people. Some of the worst people of all time. Nineveh was one of the cities of Assyria. Okay? Now, I just, we need to do this for a couple minutes, so don't, don't, don't shut down. Now, I told you to hold your place in Jonah, right? I now need you to turn to Nahum. You said Nay what? Yeah. Nahum. Yeah. Nahum. Happiness is knowing where Nahum is found. Okay, so listen, just two books to the right of Jonah, you're going to find Nahum, okay? All right, just, just want to help you with that. Nahum, chapter number three, to get a better visual of who the Ninevites were. Did everybody find Nahum? Don't lose Jonah, Okay? Now, how about this as an introduction to a city? Nahum chapter number three. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victims never depart. In other words, we're going to kill whatever we want to, whenever we want to, and if you happen to show up, and you're not the kind of people we want you to want we like being around, we'll just kill you. Nobody's going to Nineveh for a vacation. The brochure would say, Woe to the bloody city. You said, family, we're going. I don't think so. Okay. These people were just like. The power that the Syrians had, Nineveh was one of those cities, and they were called here a bloody city, just killing folk, torturing folk all the day long. That's the kind of people they were. His victims never depart. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots, horsemen charged with a bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain and a great number of bodies. They just killed people. So, you get the visual? Okay. So God says, their wickedness has come up before me. No kidding. 
Jonah, I want you to go there to preach to those people. And Jonah's like, ain't no way. I ain't going to preach to them. I can't stand them people. They kill folk, kill a lot of our people. And I'm supposed to go there to help them? They need to bust hell wide open. Why don't you just destroy them and get rid of them rather than trying to save them? And I told you earlier that God has great passion for the lost. And the very people we don't want to preach to are the people that God loves too. Okay. So Jonah says, I'm not going. I ain't trying to help them. Why should I help them? Worst people on the face of the earth. And I'm supposed to try to preach to them? And if some of them believe the word, they're going to get saved? I don't want them saved. They need to die. How many people, how many communities have you looked at and just wish God would just, rot, just wipe off the face of the earth? Because you don't like them. They're different from you. They're hate, hatred, full of hatred. They kill folk. They sell drugs to people. They break in your houses. They terrorize your communities. And you just wish that something would happen to the folk around the corner. Get rid of them people. But God expects us to go around the corner to save them too. Because his passion for the lost is greater than you could ever imagine. Why would God want to save these people? Let them die. Jonah says, I ain't going. So he goes down to Joppa and finds a boat. I'm going to Tarsha. Now, you want me to preach to somebody, I can preach to them folk, the ones out there in Pepper Pike and Chagrin Falls and all that. Let me go down there, over there. I ain't going down on Longwood. I ain't trying to go down there. I ain't trying to go down on 22nd and Cedar. I don't want to be down there. Why you got to send me down there to them people? I lights, I told you it's going to just be me. I just know. I, I done told you that. Okay. So, Jonah gets in a boat and goes to Tarshish. Let me say to you, when you want to run away from God, there's going to be always a boat ready to take you to Tarshish. Come on now. Come on now. There's always a boat waiting for you. Yes, sir. Okay? Anytime you want to run away from God, there will be opportunities to do that. Yes, sir. It'll be made easy for you. There'll be a boat waiting for you. Anytime you want to go back in them streets, there's always going to be an opportunity for you to go. There's always going to be somebody that you can hang out with. Shank Shank's out there waiting for you. Pookie Ray Ray and Butchie them. They waiting. As soon as you walk out of here and decide which way you want to turn, if you're running away from God, there'll be opportunities for you to find it. Because just that's how it is. So it was with Jonah. Jonah's in amazing and in a major conflict with God because he don't like what God is doing wanting to say these people. So I'll just go somewhere else.
Be careful when you go somewhere that God didn't call you to go to. Okay? Watch your steps. Be careful. Because the place you think you're going that's going to be better will be worse for you. Okay? Be careful. Now, Jonah knew the word of the Lord because he was a prophet. God talked to him directly. They had conversations. They had a relationship. Okay? Now, Jonah knew he couldn't escape the, the presence of God. But when he got into the boat, he was really saying, I'm quit. Because if that's what you want me to do, I ain't doing this. Nobody in here has ever felt like quitting before, did, or have they? Hmm? Nobody has ever wanted to quit. Okay? Jonah heard the call of God and said, no. Now, Jesus quotes Jonah, says stuff about Jonah several times in Scripture. And I always wanted to know, wonder why he did that. There are some amazing parallels between Jonah and Jesus. Okay? And you don't have to stretch the Scriptures for that because it's right there. Okay? God called Jonah gave him a calling, and he said no. But when it came to Jesus, lived in the beauties of heaven, worshipped by the angels of heaven, and God says, Jesus, I want you to go to earth and preach to some people that really need to bust hell wide open, but I want you to go and preach to them and save them. Now, those people are going to reject you. They're going to torture you. They're going to crucify you, and you're going to die at their hands. But I want you to go to save them from the judgment of God. Yes, sir. Jonah said, no. Ain't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus said yes? Because we would not be here, yet he, he not died for our sins. What an amazing contrast. Jesus said, I'll go. Jonah says, I'm not. Here's a question. If God didn't, if Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, why didn't he just stay where he was? Why go to Tarshish? Okay, think about it. Jonah was a prophet, which means he received special revelation from God. God and Jonah spoke directly. They had conversations, like he and Moses and, and others, other prophets of Scripture. Now, Jonah being disobedient would have shut off any direct re re revelation from God because he was disobedient to him. Now, he could have come up with his own, but that would have meant he would now become a false prophet. And if he stopped prophesying altogether, then the people would know something was wrong between God and Jonah, so Jonah had to leave. Are y'all there? Are you with me? So he had to leave, because if he and God are not in communication anymore and the people are expecting some prophecy from him, why hasn't God spoken to you, Jonah? So the people would know that there was a problem with their prophet, so he has to leave to avoid that. And that's why he had to go. Now let's bring it home. If you ever decide you want to go to Tarshish. You're going to go. And in going, you're going to realize that it ain't going to be what you thought it was. See? And Jonah 
He is going to see that in just a moment. Okay? So, let's look back at Jonah. We back at Jonah. Y'all didn't lose it, did you? Okay, all right. Jonah, let's look at verse 4 and get through here. I got to hurry. I got to hurry. Got to hurry. Got to hurry. Okay. Verse 4, but the Lord sent the great wind on the sea. Who sent it? The Lord sent it. Okay? And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. That's how bad it was. Now, Scripture makes it clear that Mother Nature ain't got nothing to do with this stuff. Okay? Mother Nature doesn't control nature. Nature operates because God does it. Remember the disciples when they were in the boat and the storm came? I told you there were some parallels. Matthew's account in chapter 8. And when the storm was over, it ended because Jesus, peace be still. And the disciple says, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. This ain't about no mother nature, y'all. Don't get it twisted. God's in control. Now when the storms show up and we're faced with them, we have two choices. Choice number one is either God is in control over all things or God is helpless in all things and is just an observer with no control. Which one you going to pick? I choose to serve a God that's in control. And I pray you will too. Verse number five introduces us to the crew. Okay? The mariners were afraid. Every man cried out to his God. Don't, don't miss that. And threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lower parts of the ship, laid down and was asleep. Remember Jesus was asleep on the boat? And the boat was, was, was out there doing all kind of crazy stuff on the sea, Galilee. And they went down to Jesus and said, don't you care that we perish? And they wake Jesus up. Okay. They wake Jonah up. All right. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean? Sleeper, arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. We didn't call on our God and ain't nothing happened. But maybe if you call on your God, we can get some help. What a, what a, what a, what a belief. Anybody ever come to you and ask you to pray for them? Said, would you pray for me? Because I know you're going to be in church on Sunday. We done had some prayer requests today from folk who aren't here but know you was going to be here and ask you to pray or have the church pray for them. Maybe your God will help us. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So their lots cast were cast, and they fell on Jonah. Now, Proverbs chapter 16, we'll have time to turn there. When you read that, Solomon says that even God controls that. Okay? He's in control of even the casting of lots. Picking straws. Short straw lose, Floyd. Pick one. God's in control of that, too. Okay? And the lot fell on Jonah. Verse number eight. Then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause it is this trouble has come upon us. What is your occupation? 
and where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? Tell us something. So he said to them, I'm Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah now confesses to these men who the true God is because they know that their gods aren't the true God. And after hearing what Jonah had to say to them about the true God, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what have you done why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. In other words, Jonah told them the story. Okay? He told them the story of he and the problems that he had with the Lord. Right? That's verse number 10. Are you still there? Verse number 11, then they said to him, what shall we do? And that's a question that every man has to ask himself when he is facing the judgment of God. What shall we do? That was a question asked for Pete, to Peter in the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Amen that the sea may be calm for us, for the Lord was growing, for the sea was growing more temperous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. So here's the question. How did Jonah know that if he goes into the water, that the sea would be calm? How did he know? Because when he made his confession to the men, he had gotten his relationship back with God. So now he and God are back on speaking terms. Okay, all right, all right. He didn't say, just throw me in the water and I'll die. He said, if you throw me in the water, then the sea will become calm. How would he have known that unless God told him? Through inference, we know that there was a conversation, a relationship restored. Okay? God told him to tell the men. Now, here is what's interesting again. Verse number 13. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land. In other words, this is what's going on, okay? Get this. They said, Jonah said, throw me in the water. Everything will be cool. We'll be good to go. And they said, no, we don't want to do that, okay? Here's what we'll do. We'll just row hard. We'll just get there, and we, we don't want you to sacrifice yourself because all we got to do is try harder and that's what happens to men today when they hear the gospel call they always think that they can fix it themselves they, if I live better life will be better I can escape the judgment of God if I just roll harder if I just try harder if I just do things better then I'll be okay and you can't do it by yourself So their first response is like the same thing that happened to men today. I can do it. I got this. We're going to roll harder, Jonah, and we'll get there. And the harder they rolled, the more the winds and the waves came. Because God wants you to know that you can do nothing about your life without me. 
okay? You can roll as hard as you want to, but you ain't going to make it unless you choose to make it with me. You can't live good enough. You can't roll hard enough. You need God. But look at the verse. Nevertheless, the man, the men rolled hard to return to the land in four tremendous words, but they could not, and neither can you. For the sea continued to grow more tempest against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Repentance by the men. They cried out to the Lord. Remember, they was worshiping other gods. And now they realize we got to worship the true God. See, uh, our gods ain't working. I'm going to tell you now that, that your religion is not going to work. Your denomination is not going to work. Okay? You have to serve the true God and living God, your church won't work, your religion won't work, because there's only one church that works. Christ died for one church, for one body of people. So all that you got that you've been thinking about, thinking that you are doing what, you, what God wants you to do, you will come to realize that all of that stuff is wrong and ain't going to work. So they turned from their God to the true God. They picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. It's easy to cry out to the Lord when stuff is rough. They did all that after the sea settled down. So the question is, what do you say to God when God then brought you through something? Do you offer praise and sacrifice to him when he's brought you through something? Okay, We're quick to do it while we're going through it, crying out to the Lord in the midst of the storm. But when the storm is over and he's brought you through, what do you do now? These men give us a great example. And I'm, I'm going to shut down and be done. Here's a parallel. Jonah offered his life to save the men in the boat. Jesus offered his life to save mankind. Now, Jonah offered. Jesus offered. Right? Nobody made Christ do it. He says, no man can take my life. I lay it down. Okay. We can't make it in this life without the sacrifice that Christ gave us. And it's time that we accept him Knowing that without Jesus, we would be nothing. We don't row hard enough. We can't live good enough. We can't try hard enough. It's Christ's sacrifice that makes it possible. An amazing parallel between Jonah and Christ. Jonah offers himself. Jesus offers himself. Why didn't Jonah just jump overboard? Because, see, it has to come as an offering, okay? Jesus couldn't nail himself to the cross. Men had to do it, okay? Men had to do it. Jesus couldn't crucify himself on the cross. He offered himself for that. 
and today for us to understand the sacrifice that Jesus made in this tremendous, outstanding book to get us started. It's just the introduction, okay? You wait till the night, ch chapter three. Oh, it's going to be something else. But, but the introduction, and I, I pray that you got something from it, that it wasn't too boring for you, but we just had to set the tone, okay? And we're going to flow easy and freely more and more as in the next three sermons, okay? But I want you to know that these men repented. They cried out to the Lord. They made confession unto the Lord. Okay? All right? All right? And, and how that relates to our New Testament salvation, that we have to repent. We have to believe. Okay? We have to confess. All right? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We've got to cry out to him and obey his word and obey his will. Okay? And we see that in chapter number one. Number, number one today. Anybody here today who's not a Christian can follow the example of these men who cried out unto God. They realize that there's only one true and living God and that he is in, in control of all things. All things, amen? Somebody say all things. All things. He's sovereign over them all, okay? Jonah was thrown overboard because of his sin. Jesus was offered to die, not because of his sin, but because of our sin. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 21, he became, the, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. For he made himself who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. That invitation is extended to you today. Hearing the word, believing the word, repenting of your sins, confessing, crying out to the Lord that he is, he is the Lord, the Lord of your life, the Lord of all our lives. That confession brought death to Jesus will bring life to you and to be buried in the watery grave of baptism because he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the invitation to you